what a movie, what a film. Um, I'm just going to go right into it because I know I only have about 25, 30 minutes and just FYI, unfortunately, there are no audience questions. I, so I just wanted to warn anyone, you know, and I hope I get to, I'm asking the questions you want answered. And the cinematographer, Renal, couldn't be here because he's had a long day filming and he is your husband and shot this beautiful film. So let's also talk about the fun part when you have filmmakers talking is that we're gonna we're gonna talk about the story, but we also will dive into some of the technical stuff in between. Let's talk a little bit about how you guys work together. Well, we fight a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we fight a lot. <laughs> um, but he's amazing, as you as 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 you see, he's brilliant, and um, I think he's he's got just. You know, w we we sort of have this language now where you know I don't really have to say very much. He understands what I'm looking for. He's got an extraordinary eye, um, but the skill that he has uh, the most, which is which is kind of the skill that you really want doc Verde camera shooters to have, is he's an amazing listener, and he has this uncanny ability to sort of know because he has really good instincts. So he has this uncanny ability to know where to put the camera when, you know, like he's really engaged. And, and so uh, because he's so good and because we fight a lot, I, I still work with him. <laughs> and how did you two start working together? And Michael, why did you want to take on this project? Right, yeah. Uh, I'll just take a moment to second what Anisha said about Renal and as an editor, you, especially with observational or verite documentaries, if you've got a director of photography who's got great anticipation and is covering a scene, um, you know, in a, in a very full way, then it makes my job a lot easier, and he's, I think, a master at it, for sure. Um, I met Nisha, I think, probably at the National Film Board of Canada. We were, I was working on another film, or you had seen the previous film I'd done, and we started having conversations, and... Uh, what, w what was that film? Uh, the film I was working on was called This Is Not a Movie. It's about the uh, journalist Robert Fisk um, by Jung Chang. And uh, that, uh, I guess, was the more recent film that Nisha had seen. I'd also uh, done Stories We Tell by Sarah Pauly, and Nisha was aware of that as well. So, so yeah. And, of course, I was aware of Nisha's work. And um, we, once we started working together and we got in each other's wavelength, I think things went pretty well. Yeah. yeah. At at what point did you start working together? Because with documentaries, as you're saying, you thought you were going to make a film in one way, and then it evolved. At what point? What was that inflection point? And how were those conversations between you two? Um, well, I was actually working. I was working with a different editor. I was working with an editor named Dave Kazala, who's sort of a long time. It's been a long time collaborator, and uh, it was a you know there was an extensive amount of material. We were working for a really long time. And, you know, I think we just kind of, uh, Dave was exhausted. <laughs> and, um, and, and I brought on Mike, and, and Mike was incredible. And then eventually we brought Dave back in. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, I would say, for me, just one of the most incredible creative collaborations I've ever been involved, when, uh, involved in, because it was two really brilliant, two really, really brilliant minds, and, and everyone worked so beautifully together, you know? So it was, it was a, I thought it was a really beautiful, a beautiful partnership. And I just have to say how I, how I decided I wanted to work with Mike. So I was watching, um, I was watching This Is Not A Movie, the, the Robert Fisk doc, um, specifically for the score, because I was looking for a composer. And I got so sucked into the story that I stopped paying attention to the score. And I ran into him, and I just said, "You've just cost me two hours of my life." <laughs> 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 and um, and I think it was. I mean, obviously, stories we tell is a is a masterpiece of filmmaking, um, but that Fisk film was just so brilliant, and it had one of the best openings I've ever seen in a documentary. And it was so clear to me that this person was a masterful storyteller. So. It's really interesting, Nisha, because you know, with the way that I, I ran into Asif Manvi, he's a good friend outside because he had seen the previous um, showing, and he just was like, "It this is like a perfect documentary," 
because you are just sitting there and you're trying to figure out if justice is going to come for her. The kind of crafting of the storytelling and the revelations and when and moving back and forth, like you're keeping us on the edge of our seat as if we're watching like any type of you know narrative film. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about those decisions about how to reveal things and when that both of you worked on together. Well, the you know the the situation. I mean, there's there's kind of a procedural aspect to the film to do with the the courts, and um, so I think that there's dramatic elements that, uh, in a classic storytelling sense, you know, you're 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 building tension, you're building anticipation, different things. So it it in fact isn't isn't much different than a mm -hmm. scripted film the way you would approach it. You know, the scenes have to be uh, done in a dramatic way. I mean, part of I think well, you know part of uh, how the film will get out to people and why how why it'll be successful and why more people will see it is in part because it's engaging and it's uh, suspenseful to watch. You know, so um, for sure those are part. That's part of it. And uh, I would I would say for for us in the field, like with um, there were a couple of things. I mean, one, you know, you just sort of knew in terms of what he was going through. Um, as a human being, you know, what you had, uh, and, and you've got a beginning, a middle, and an end as, as well, right? And and so what you have when someone is going through something like that, who's, it's, you know, it is a David and Goliath story, so you realize, okay, you've got, what you have is, is a traditional hero's journey, you know, and, and so you just have to, you just have to follow that that storyline. And, and of course, in, in this case, uh, the obstacles that he was dealing with were both outside of him, they were external, and they were also you know his own kind of insecurities and his and his own and his own weaknesses. Um, so y you know you're very aware of 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 what that is going to look like, and so then you're starting to visually, um, uh, you're just you know you're doing things right. Like so, for example, uh, you know the the scene of of the trucks arriving with the accused, right? That was a very deliberate kind of like okay, well, how do we now introduce? We now have to introduce these guys because they're they're also characters right you have to th you have to think of this almost as you know as mike was saying it's it's a drama right it's a procedural drama so you just have to inter you know you have to introduce the various characters and and so you just figure out ways with your uh, with your team uh, you know you just establish those in, in the field and then i think the for us the other thing that we realized two things that we one that mike realized that was so brilliant but you know we realized in the field that ranjith is the kind of person who everything plays out on his face, right? He's, his face r reveals so much, it speaks volumes, you know? And so we knew that that was going to be uh, where the drama uh, resided, you know, to, to a degree. And then Mike had a really brilliant um, epiphany, I think, in the edit. Like, we, we were editing, and, and I kept saying to Mike, this isn't, this is too fast. It's got to be slower. It's we need mm -hmm. we need more. You got to hold on that shot longer, right? It was yeah. this constant kind of like yeah. uh, not quite right. And then Mike realized actually what we needed to do was to honor Ranjit's pace. You know, mm -hmm. the the film actually had to be him, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think in fact, um, you know, often we'll hold on Ranjit at the end of a scene or in in the middle of a scene. There's a moment with him, and literally, I think. Almost every time we do that, I've taken it to the final possible frame <laughs> that existed, and in fact, even slowed it down a little at the end. So it was kind of I, I couldn't get enough of, yeah. or we couldn't get enough of him, yeah. you know, in those yeah. moments, yeah. and it, yeah. and it was very, it was kind of uh, deceptive in a way. You don't think much is going on when you kind of yeah. first look at it, but in fact, his, mm -hmm. his uh, presence in his face is just uh, mm -hmm. so full of. Uh, you know, humanity, you know, so. The additional layer in this film is the, you know, the the storyline about the filmmakers getting involved with the story mm -hmm. and the danger that you also encounter. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to ask, to dig into that more, but also ask that when you were making this film, did you even think that you would be a part of the story in some way? Mm -hmm. And at what point, even in the edit, that may have been, like, yeah. um, drawn out? I, I think I think I started to realize uh, I didn't know if I was we were going to be part of the the story. I don't think that that was a conscious 
you know, I think that was something that evolved when we started to realize, oh, we really are part of the story, and you know, we can either ignore it and you know remove it from the edit from the edit, which would have been a lie, um, or we embrace it, and you know, we we could have embraced it way more extensively because there was just so much material where it was like, okay, you know, where where that could have been sort of its own thread, right? And we and we did we did discuss it, it but it was just would have been really un unwieldy. Um, but I think, I, I think, you know, the first, you know, that scene where mom says, do you think it's wrong that we call the police, right? There's that moment where she, where she asks that question. Well, in reality, what happened a after that, after she asked that question is, uh, we were told to stop filming. So some villagers, this is very early on in the shoot and some villagers came in and they asked us to stop shooting. Well, they asked mom to say, you know, tell, tell them to stop shooting. She got really anxious, really nervous. Um, you know, we stopped filming, and I think at that point I started to realize, okay, we're we're having an impact. You know, we're we're having an uh, an effect here, and then of course it it peaks. You know, in that in that scene in in, in the village. So, yeah. I, and how? I mean, this is such a sensitive topic and story, and you're filming with such a young character as well, in, in this incredibly vulnerable place how did you as filmmakers you know who are not of the place also build this trust and this relationship mm -hmm. with your characters and in particular Karen mm -hmm. uh, yeah that was that was really I mean filming her was just it was so hard it was it was it was a really difficult thing actually you know yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that was really tough um I, you know, to be you know to be really transparent, that the interview that you see, that master interview, was actually done after the trial was over. I never interviewed. I never interviewed her before, like in terms of a master interview. I did, of course, occasionally ask her some questions just to make her feel comfortable. Uh, but the the big the big key interview was was done some was done way af way later, and I don't know if I ever felt comfortable filming her. I don't mm. I don't think I ever felt comfortable. I think, uh, I think I did it because I felt like I had to, and it was my job as a documentary filmmaker. I think the only time I felt comfortable was was that interview because it was so clear to me. You know, a she'd come out of it right, like it was it was over. That part of that part of the ordeal was 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 over, um, and I could sense in that interview that she wanted to talk to me, that she wanted to unburden. And interestingly enough, like one of the things that I did sort of about halfway into that interview or about 25 minutes into that interview is I actually got my crew to leave. Like I asked Mernal and, and the sound recordist to, to leave and just to leave me alone with her. It, was it just felt like it was, it just felt like she needed to really unburden, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, that was the process, yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's incredible the impact this film has had, you know, and, y uh, you know, it's, you hear names like, you know, Asifa or Nirbhaya, and now we have Kiran, and then this is an incident that continues to unfortunately happen, um, not just in India, but in many places. And I know that you have an incredible impact campaign that you're also trying to do with this film. Can you please share um, what you hope this film will do for victims of assault? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, we do have like uh, partners that we're working with and uh, other part other relationships that we're developing. Um, but I think for for us, the, the goals there are, there are two key goals, and one, of course, is to inspire other other survivors of sexual violence to come forward and and to seek justice. Um, to change those systems that prevent them from coming forward, to, you know, and, and, and seeking justice, uh, sensitizing those systems, um, asking ourselves uh, as a society, what are the obstacles? Why do we put them in, in, in front of in front of survivors? And then the second big piece for me is having this very important conversation on masculinity, because you know that really is the missing piece. Like when you talk about gender justice and when you talk about um, uh, you know, equality and, and women's rights. We never talk about men. We never talk about the fact that we have to raise our sons differently. 
you know that's really the that's really the key and and for me that's what's so extraordinary about ranjit is that uh, especially in in india you know as the ngo says right like he is a, he has the potential to be a role model right he is he is an exceptional man he is an exceptional father and sadly it's it's true he is uh, and we need more men like him so I, my 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 hope is that the film galvanizes and that you know that we can actually have an impact on masculinity I was just wondering only because um, I, I, I'm curious about it. Did the conversation around caste ever really come up in the village, especially when there were notions of like the, you know, the you know the guy in the orange shirt, <laughs> like you know he just felt better than everyone. I mean, the moment he calls Ranji the loser, that's just like a stab, you know. So I wanted to understand some of that as well. And if if and you don't re necessarily address it as much, and I was just wondering about that choice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I, d I, I actually don't address it, and um, I mean, for m for me, uh, I think part part of it was just, you know, it was complicated. You know, it's just it's a it's an extra layer that's sort of complicated. But I also felt that it was so apparent just visually. You know, I mean, that was one of the things that we did. You know with in the courts right like just we made a decision it wasn't a decision it was the truth but you know if you if you if you look at that if you look at those uh if you look at those courts every single person that's seeking justice they're all poor they're all lower caste right i mean and the lawyers in their robes are all upper caste it's it's so clear that there is um a dichotomy you know so yeah but for me it just felt like it was implied Michael, have you edited films that are in a language that is not your own before, and how did you navigate <laughs> that aspect of you know foreign language, foreign culture? Uh, right, yeah. Um, well, it actually is simpler than it would seem because all of the rushes are are subtitled, at least in a in a kind of a quick way, so you kind of get the gist of what they're saying. Um, and I found that, in fact, I just before uh, worked with Nisha, I, I worked on a film called Batata, which is about Syrian um, refugees in Lebanon, um, and it actually won the Peabody Award for a documentary just recently. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and uh, that, that film was entirely in Arabic, and it was a similar situation. Um, Nisha, of course, speaks Hindi, and I have I had a great assistant uh, named Pranay Nishani, who uh, is also a native speaker. So I would always I could ask any moment, you know, if I was confused about something, you know, sometimes I'd cut the end off a sentence, not knowing that I'd done that. But uh, <laughs> and and sometimes because the translations were done so quickly, I somebody would be talking for a minute, and there'd be like one sentence of <laughs> translation. So I said, I think they're saying more than that here. So. Um, but it, it actually wasn't, uh, it wasn't really uh, an impediment uh, to, to editing. You know, funny enough, we all, everybody communicates in sentences no matter what language it is, so you kind of know when a sentence is done. And the emotions are the same, you, you know, across the human, you know, uh, experience. So it's very, very similar. So, yeah. so the score in this film is also incredibly beautiful. And let's just talk about your, the direction you gave your composer and the collaboration between the three of you when it came to elevating yeah. scenes and when to have score or not. Yeah, so yeah you go, you start. start. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, God, where do we start? So this, the score was like a real, uh, that was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of back and forth and a lot of experimentation. And I think, you know, in, in some sense, it was really, I think Mike and I were really clear in terms of what we were looking for and what we were hoping for and you know for me i just sort of felt there's the f the family is in a state of suspension right Every, everything is suspended their life isn't they're not grounded um and everything is so kind of internal and and it was it was really something that was um felt as opposed to heard you know it's just this idea that you that you not that you're mirroring what's going on, but that it's an but it that it's an an extra kind of it's a different element, you know, and it and it sort of was all about this feeling of being suspended, 
right? And then Jonathan, the, the composer that we ended up working with, who's so brilliant, who also does all of Sarah Pauli's films. I actually, I, I've worked, every, everyone that worked on the film is, is, is uh, you know, somebody that Sarah Pauli works with. Um, so Jonathan, uh, Jonathan is one of those people, he's so brilliant, his process is, he watches your film without any music. He doesn't want any temp score. He doesn't want to hear your film with score. He wants to respond to it purely uh, without anything interfering. And, sorry, and, um, uh, and and he really trusts his instincts, which is which is amazing, you know. So so that's that's how he works. And when when he watched the film, the first thing he said to us to, to us was, "You don't need music." <laughs> <laughs> so when when a composer says that, you know, that's exactly the person you want to work with, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his his sensibility was really uh, you know suited to this for sure. And we we found that um, we didn't want the music to be. Um, leading in any way dr like the because we're playing with dramatic mm -hmm. uh, tropes in the film and it's a very delicate film we found that if we had something that was too kind of conventionally dramatic in the music it was just too like it would just take it too far in that direction it the music had to be uh less active in that way and and more atmospheric you know so that that's mm -hmm. i mean for sure we had to we had to pull back on any ideas of, of dramatically enhancing or enhancing the drama with music at all. We, we wanted to stay away from that, yeah. I have one more question. I hope this is what you guys want to hear <laughs> more about. I mean, you have incredible executive producers who are also raising the visibility for this film. All of you have a responsibility to t tell your friends about this movie and to support it and get the word out. Nisha, when are you gonna show this film to in India in the, in the way that it really needs to be shared and have the people in the village seen this, has the family seen it? Yeah. And how can we really hope that this movie, it's, got, it's taken on a big job and we want that job to be fulfilled? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, f the family has seen it and they've, they've, they've come to screenings in, in the UK, which is really amazing. Um, the ward member saw it and he loved the film. And <laughs> it was <laughs> amazing. And what he, what he said just kind of blew us all the way, right? And this kind of speaks to the fact that I it can change things, you know? So he, when he watched the film, he actually said that he was ashamed of himself and that he felt that the entire community needed to see this film in order for them to see what they put this family through. So, you know, it, it really does have the power, right, to kind of af affect people. And it, it's the strength of this family, right? It's the resilience of this family and this, you know, this 13-year-old child who's sort of the moral heart of the film, right? So, and, you know, of course, uh, we're gonna do sort of extensive work in terms of going across the country with, within communities and villages. Uh, but we've got a lot of things that we want to do, you know, create a coalition of survivors in India so that Garen isn't, you know, alone and, um, uh, you know, a, a legal defense fund, uh, working on masculinity, working with, w working with partners, uh, laws. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of work that, that we, that we want to do. So, yeah. Well, I, you know, full disclosure, I will say that myself and my partners, Pri and Mega, please raise your hands, are very happy to be partnered with Nisha on this film and to <laughs> support it. And we just are so proud of you both for an incredible film. And as filmmakers, as people in this society, as audience members, we're just so happy a beautiful, important film like this exists. So thank you. And both our films open the same yes, weekend. Exactly. So <laughs> I had a, we both had premieres yesterday. <laughs> so oh, my film's called Tripped Up. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a comedy. It's very different. <laughs> but people cry at some point, so too. So. But thank you all for coming. And please support yeah. this incredible movie. Thank you. So thank, much. you. thank you. And thank you, Shruti, for, for joining us tonight. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.